So this video is all about stereotypes, prejudice and discrimination, which is really all about us and them. This topic is all about our tendency to search for meaning in relation to trying to make sense of other people and it's about the kinds of shortcuts we take because we never get a full enough picture of other people's lives to get a proper sense of who they are. You know, we just get snapshots and glimpses of other people's lives. So we form shortcuts and then we have feelings about people based on those shortcuts and then we behave towards those people in a particular way based on those shortcuts. And often those shortcuts are harmful. And that's what this video is really all about. So let's start off with some definitions of those three key words. So stereotypes. These are beliefs or associations that connect a whole social group of people with certain traits or characteristics. So gender stereotypes would be an example, like women are bad drivers. Now prejudice. These are negative feelings towards people who are seen as members of that group. So saying something like, I don't feel safe when a woman is driving the bus. I feel more comfortable if a man was driving the bus. I don't think that, by the way. I really don't think that. Now, discrimination. This is all about acting negatively towards members of that social group. An example would be not hiring women as bus drivers. Basically, stereotypes are all about how we think, prejudice is all about how we feel, and discrimination is all about how we act. Now, go to the prescribed text for all the fine-grained detail on the different theories and research that's been done in this area. I'm not going to go through that, what's in the text, because you know, you've got the textbook, which is perfectly suited to delivering you that content. In this video, I'm not going to look at the content of the textbook, but I'm going to hook us into some broader issues to help ignite some discussion amongst us. Hopefully in our tutorial, if you're enrolled in the unit or in the comments below this YouTube video. So we allocate people to a social group and use our understanding of that social group to guide our understanding of everyone we allocate to that group. And some of the most often used social groups are based on gender, sexuality, disability, ethnicity, age, race and religion. Now, with ethnicity and nationality, these are not biological concepts, but purely social constructions. You know, there's no gene that makes you Australian, for example. So. With these groups, membership can be fluid. You know, you can argue your way out of one group being, say, British, and into another group, say, being Australian. And I hope I can anyway. Now, you can move from one group to another by a social process, such as by a legal process. For example, becoming a citizen of a country. Now, those social groups that are seen as based on biological or genetic traits of its members are much less fluid and you are much less able to move between the categories. So sex is one, though it's being challenged. You know, here there's been a fight to make it a social category rather than a biological or genetic category. You know, the biological and genetic basis of sex has been challenged. People say that just because you were born male, that doesn't mean you are male. And as part of that struggle, a distinction has been made between sex and gender. People are said to be born one sex, but that their gender is socially assigned and learned. Now, how about sexuality? Well, this is an interesting one because the opposite has happened. There's been a fight to establish sexuality as a biological category. Here, the category was seen as non-biological. It was viewed as learned behavior that could be unlearned, but has shifted more and more to being seen as a biological category. You know, you're born gay. You don't learn to be gay. You know, you can't train someone not to be gay. Yeah? So what's happening here? Why the shift to a biological category? It's, it's a really interesting space right now. And it's a really interesting space, but it's also become a quite a confused, confused space, if I can say that. Confused space. So let's just nail down some definitions here. Sexual orientation. This is an inherent or immutable, enduring, emotional, romantic or sexual attraction to other people. Notice how the word immutable is there. See where that's getting tied to something we would associate with a gene or genetic component. Gender identity. You know, this is one's innermost concept of self as a male, female, a blend of both or neither. 
and how individuals perceive themselves and what they call themselves. You know, one's gender identity can be the same or different from their sex assigned at birth. Gender expression. This is the external appearance of one's gender identity. It's usually expressed through behavior like clothing, haircut or voice and such things. Um, it may or may not conform to socially defined behaviors and characteristics that are typically associated with being either masculine or feminine. Transgender. This is an umbrella term for people whose gender identity and or expression is different from cultural expectations based on the sex that they are assigned at birth. Now, being transgender doesn't imply any specific sexual orientation. Therefore, transgender people may be um, identifying as straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual or whatever. Gender transition. This is the process by which some people strive to more closely align their internal knowledge of gender with its outward appearance. So some people socially transition, whereby they might begin dressing using names and pronouns and or be socially recognized as another gender. Others undergo physical transitions in which they modify their bodies through medical interventions. Gender dysphoria. This is seen as the clinically significant distress caused when a person's assigned birth gender is not the same as the one which they identify with. Now, according to our friends in the American Psychiatric Association, the good old Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM, this is the term uh, that is replacing what used to be called gender identity disorder. They think this new term it better characterizes the experiences of people who are affected, particularly children and adolescents, but also adults. So, yep, we've turned it into a mental illness. Yay, we can turn lots of things into mental illness. Have you noticed that? Anyway, moving on. Now, we're going to focus on gender and sexuality because it's an interesting space, but also because it's presently being fought over. And um, an example of the interesting stuff that's happening is Jordan Peterson, the clinical psychologist Jordan Peterson, who's the YouTube star, you know, big, mighty famous Jordan Peterson. And now he came to fame because of his stance against shifting our use of pronouns to reflect people who have shifted their gender. Now we're going to talk about Jordan Peterson much more later, but um, now I've got to let's do, just have a look at a quick clip of. Um, Someone who is questioning Ben Shapiro, who's another person who challenges this idea that you can change your gender. As far as the actual psychological issues at play, it used to be called gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder, now they call it gender dysphoria. The idea that, that sex or gender are malleable is not true. But if you are going to dictate to me that I'm supposed to pretend, I'm supposed to pretend that men are women and women are men, no. My answer is no. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to modify basic biology because it threatens your subjective sense of what you are. And if I call you a moose, are you suddenly a moose? Okay, if I redefine our terms. No, it's a, yes, that's right. Men and women are a completely different thing. This is true. Have you ever met a man or a woman? They're completely different. Why is that? I don't understand. Why? Okay, let me ask you this. How, okay, I won't ask you how old. I will ask you how old you are, okay? Because you're young enough that it's probably not insulting to ask you. So, I'm 22, so I'm probably only 90, right? No, why aren't you 60? Why aren't you 60? And why, why can't you identify as 60? Why, what, what is the problem with you identifying as 60? You're right. Age is significantly less important than gender. You can't magically change your gender. You can't magically change your sex. You can't magically change your age. Interesting, eh? But by the way, Ben Shapiro has come up with a really bad argument, I think. You know, I think he's made a categorical, a categorical error. Gender is not a biological concept. Sex is. You can identify as female, even if you're biologically male. There's nothing incoherent in that. Now, in our prescribed text, you can read about in-groups and out-groups and how we're nicer to members of our own social groups and not so nice to people in other social groups. Now, if you want an example of the in-group, out-group phenomena, Look at the dominant narratives around immigration and asylum seekers. Most of the problems with this are in-group, out-group issues going on, where immigrants are and asylum seekers are seen as the other, they're disparaged as a result. This is the us and them 
idea, the us and them mentality. The in-group, us, the out-group, them. And in relation to gender, you know, you're either a boy or a girl, you're either a man or a woman. So here you see the us and them also being reflected in the binaries that we operate. You know, we split people into categories that either this or that. Now these binaries have been blurring since around the 1960s, but they remain strong. In relation to gender, we used to only dress baby girls in pink and baby boys in blue. Girls played with dolls and boys played with guns. Things are not quite as pronounced now, but gender stereotypes persist, as does discrimination against one of those binaries. If you haven't guessed, women. I know people are saying in the minute that men are being discriminated against. Trust me. <laughs> but men and women as a binary, the one side of the binary that's being discriminated against, it's women. Now these stereotypes exist at their strongest when a social group has a biological or genetic marker, if the main reason for the group's identity is a biological one. So racism and sexism and disabilism are largely as toxic and as virulent as they are because these categories are deemed biological. The thing is, race is not a biological concept. Disability rarely has a genetic cause and sex is significantly impacted by gender, with gender being a social rather than a biological concept. So actually, these things aren't inherently and simply biological, but they are perceived as biological. Now again, sexuality is interesting here, as it was a social category that some in the LGBTIQ movement have been arguing is a biological concept. Now I want us to focus on gender and sexuality by taking a look at what psychology has said about these two topics. It can be reasonably argued, I think, that women have been erased from much of the history of psychology. That's why history is sometimes referred as his story. As Bowen said in 1990, women's concerns and individual women have been invisible in the field of psychology. When you study the history of psychology, you mainly learn about the founding fathers, Ivan Pavlov, John Watson, William James, Berhus Skinner, Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung, Jean Piaget, and so on, and so on. You know, they are all men, all white men, by the way. Now, there were many women who played a significant part in the history of psychology, but they've been airbrushed out of our history. Anna Freud, Mary Witten Culkins, Mary Ainsworth, Letta Stetter Hollingworth, Karen Horney, Mamie Phipps Clark, Christine Ladd Franklin, Margaret Floy Washburn, Eleanor Maccabee. Now, have you heard of any of them? any of those women, you know? They all played a major role in the development of psychology, but most psychologists have never heard of them. Well, maybe you know of Anna Freud, but perhaps only because of her father, Sigmund. Now, has psychology had anything to say about women? Oh, yes, it has. Oh, it's had a lot to say. Here are our founding fathers. Sir Granville Stanley Hall. He introduced experiment psychology on a laboratory scale and he was the founder of the child psychology and edu educational psychology disciplines. Now he was also the first uh, APA president, American Psychological Association president in 1892. Yes, that's what he said. Herbert Spencer. He wrote Principles of Psychology in 1855. He claimed humans evolved the same way as animals. He also said women's brains are less evolved and their intellectual skills therefore more primitive. James Cattell, a specialist in individual differences and psychometrics, he attributed a declining birth rate directly to the expansion of education for women. He opposed women academics promotion to professional ranks. Hugo Munsterberg, he was the pioneer of applied psychology in clinical, industrial and forensic areas. He said women shouldn't be allowed to serve on juries because they were not capable of thinking rationally. And finally, Edward Titchener, who's a specialist in structure of the mind. He studied introspection and empathy. Turns out he may not have had an awful lot of empathy towards women. He banned women from his Society of Experimental Psychologists. Oh, you've got to mention big old daddy, Sigmund Freud. He said 
Nature has determined women's destiny through beauty, charm and sweetness. Law and custom have much to give women that has been withheld from them, but the position of women will surely be what it is. In youth, an adored darling, and in mature years, a loved wife. <clears throat> now, of course, these are the views commonly held, were, that were commonly held in society at that time these guys were writing, you know? It was a, a particular historical time in the West, and what they were saying, what these psychologists were saying about women was reflective of the social conditions experienced by women back then. And they were views that were common to intellectual circles outside of psychology. It wasn't just psychology, with psychologists saying this stuff. So, you know, Charles Darwin, he stated that the chief distinction between men and women was that men had higher intellectual powers, which showed itself in the fact that men achieved more than women. And in medicine, Dr. Edward Clark of Harvard Medical School, who wrote the book Sex and Education, said that women should not receive equal education to men, as that would be a crime against nature. And Grant Allen, a biologist and novelist, who went so far as to say women merely reproduced, men were the ones that were truly human. I kind of liken the sound of some of this. Nope, snap out of it. Stop it. It's not about you, Paul. So this is part of our history in science and in our history of psychology. You know, it's the olden days, but things are different now, aren't they? Surely psychologists are not saying such things these days, are they? Well, those ideas are still around less than a couple of decades ago. You'd be surprised. Here's what Dr. Glenn Wilson, fellow of the British Psychological Society, was saying in the 1990s. He said that 95% of bank managers company directors, judges and university professors in Britain are men because men are more competitive and dominance is a personality characteristic determined by male hormones. He said women in academic jobs are less productive than men and objectively speaking, women may already have been over promoted in those jobs. And he also said that women who do have successful careers largely do so because their brains have become masculinized. You getting angry about this? You getting angry? I'm not that fussed, I'm not a woman. And here are a couple more for you. Professor Richard Lynn, psychologist. He believes men are more intelligent than women. Last time I saw him say this was in 2010. And Paul Irwin, Richard Lynn's colleague and also a psychologist, he said the same thing in 2005. You know, that men achieve more because they're more intelligent than women. Sue Wilkinson, has cited these and other examples of how psychology has been asserting that women are inferior to men and have used this to justify women's exclusion from or limited achievements within education and professions. Well, that's, you know, what I'm quoting from there is still over, a, you know, a couple of decades ago, maybe a decade ago, you know. So we've moved on from then, haven't we, you know? You know, we've had the Me Too movement. Surely things can't be like that now. Well. That's when we're going to talk about Jordan Peterson. He's coming. He's a little snippet. I think we lie to 18 to 19 year old women non-stop, especially in universities and educational institutions. That's by, minute, by the way, sorry. By t okay, well, by telling them that career is going to be the fundamental purpose, give the fundamental purpose to their life. He doesn't think women should be going to university and getting a career. He doesn't think that will make you happy if you're a woman. Among other things, he said that women shouldn't wear makeup at work because it's signalling to men that they're sexually available. Let's stay off Peterson for now. We'll get to him later. Now, psychology has found many faults with women. These include having lower self-esteem than men, being less self-confident than men, having more difficult, difficulty developing a separate sense of self than men, being more likely to say that they're hurt than to admit that they're angry than men. However, even if such things were true, they don't have to be described as faults. Psychology describes these things as faults, but we don't have to. You know, we could say that women are less conceited than men, less likely to overvalue their work than men, less difficult, have less difficulty in forming and maintaining relationships than men, you know, less likely to accuse and attack others when they're unhappy than men. And in Carol Tavris's book, The Mismeasure of Women, we hear this um, expressed really well, that lots of psychological research on sex differences was designed to find out why women were not as good as men, you know, why they were not like men. 
You know, why they weren't as successful, why they weren't as intelligent, why they weren't as motivated, why they weren't as perceptive and so on. It um, positioned women as inferior. Now, in the next episode, I'll tell you what the real problems are about women, because there are some problems. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what they are. And it's not the driving. We got through that. We recognise that was a stereotype, wasn't it? Now, we'll also bring in that topic of sexuality. So that's part of all of this too. So, so there's more coming. Episode 14, Gender Sexuality. We're going to dive in a bit deeper. So till then, ta-da. <laughs>